Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, the skull of the mid-Jurassic plesiosaur in Cryptoclidus. Um, no prizes for guessing it. That's a heavily uh, reconstructed reconstruction with no real material at all in the museum in Paris. Um, so, Cryptoclidus uh, is one of the best-known plesiosaurians. Um, it's one of the long-necked plesiosauroids, and uh, we've seen a um, study of its neck motion uh, earlier on, thanks to Tanani. Um, and it's from the mid-Jurassic, um, Oxford clay, uh, Colovian. Uh, and in Brown's 1981 classic study of the plesiosaurs of the Upper Jurassic, uh, which included the mid-Jurassic as well, um, he worked on the, the cranium of the neotype, which you can see, uh, see there. Uh, that's uh, in the Natural History Museum in London. It's one of part of the Leeds collection. And although it's reasonably 3D, it's only partially complete. Um, but that formed the basis of Brown's reconstruction, which is down here. Um, the notable feature was that he had to reconstruct a, a very thin, vertically um, oriented dugal um, just to make sense of the surrounding bones. Uh, but there was no evidence of a sutural, sutural connection between that dugal and the maxilla. Uh, he suggested that the mechanical link went through the exoterygoid um, into the palate uh, and down to the jaw joint. Uh, and also, there's no evidence for a discrete prefrontal. If we move forward, uh, 1994, Brown and Cruikshank then described uh, this Peterborough Museum specimen here. Um, it's an almost complete but crushed skull and most of the rest of the postcranium as well. Uh, and that provided objective uh, evidence that Brown's earlier uh, hypothesis about the dugal was correct. Um, and it was a very small, thin, vertically oriented bit there. And this is the reconstruction that they came up with uh, from this specimen. Uh, so they revised it slightly. Um, but also, they looked at the circumorbital orbital bones here. Uh, they're all there, but the borders look really, really abraded. Uh, and so they thought, well, the margins aren't there, they're not preserved, so we still don't have a good idea. So a lot of this here is really a sort of dashed outline. Um, again, there was no prefrontal. Um, and that lack of a prefrontal has since been suggested to be, perhaps be due to fusion with surrounding bones, um, such as the maxilla. Um, in, in more recent studies. So this is our new specimen that we have in Leicester. Um, it's a, a complete but vertical crushed skull. Um, there's a cervical series, which you can see here. Uh, again, there's some distortion there, so sorry, it's perhaps not going to help you too much. Um, and the red there marks the rest of the skeleton that we have. So the skull, as I said, is, uh, it's all there, basically. So that's the dorsal view. Um, so we've had both of these uh, CT scanned, uh, Roger's done that, uh, and Steph, our other co-author, is now doing the segmentation. You can see here it's a work in progress. Uh, but basically this confirms the earlier study. We have the dugal there, um, so that's the, the Brown and Cruikshank version, and yes, it pops up, thankfully, in the, uh, the CT scan. Uh, and in the lesser specimen, if you look at this region here, it's really, really thin, it's really, really, really thin, but there's this wafer there, and if I just click on, so we have a little wafer of dugal attached there to the scamosal. There's a bit of faceting here on the postorbital, and then there's a little tiny nub in there wedged in just behind the maxilla. So I think this is the remains of the dugal on our specimen. Um, it's really, really hard to see, but I think it's there. Uh, if we look at the skull roof, um, so here we are, and one thing that all cryptoclides seem to have is that. Uh, Again, shades of one of the earlier talks today. The, the frontal suture is not viewed, so it's an open suture there. Uh, this thing here is the maxilla uh, ascending process coming up uh, in front of the orbit. Um, and this is what we have from the CT scans. So here have the frontals. We have this open suture down the middle. Uh, and if you peel away this maxilla ascending process underneath, you find a little tiny prefrontal. So it's not completely absent, it's just very, very, very small, it's vestigial, and it's usually covered up in the specimens in which we have it by the maxilla ascending process. So, hooray, we've found the cryptoclidid prefrontal, at least for cryptoclidus. Um, it also shows that the apparently incomplete nature of the orbital margin in the early specimen actually is real. It's just a very, very poorly ossified, sort of crenulated, fingered sort of margin. You can see it down here, we have the sort of highly fingering uh, appearance of the front of the postfrontal. We have this sort of cleft here in between postfrontal and frontal, and the frontal margin here is fingered, 
and it only really becomes robust once we get round to this ascending process in the maxilla. That's the only real solid bit of the orbital margin, if you like. So here's a revised, revised reconstruction. So we've got the crenulated orbital margin around here, the sort of smooth, robust margin formed by the ascending process of the maxilla. Um, and if we pop in the, the hidden prefrontal there, and you know, what is actually happening with the rest of the, the jugal, does it contact the maxilla, does it not? Is it a ligamentous connection? It's still something we don't really know. Uh, but again, interesting, the, the talk with the uh, varanus, again, lack of a post orbital bar, um, contacting the, the, ma the maxilla there and the open frontal suture. It suggests perhaps this skull is less able to sustain, um, sustain strain, but perhaps cryptoclides were um, increasing the flexibility. Maybe the, f you know, the skull might have flexed out a little bit and perhaps we are maximizing the oral um, cavity to, to uh, maximize sieve feeding or suspension feeding maybe. That's been hypothesized with the, uh, with the, the, the rather homodont uh, tooth um, arcade here. If you look at the orbital margin, um, what we did here was uh, trace around here. Uh, and then if we then take those traces, and I've colored the robust bit at the front formed by the ascending process of maxilla blue. The rest is red. That's the sort of crenulated, fingered, poorly ossified margin. Um, if you then export that trace as a JPEG um, or a bitmap, then count the blue pixels, red pixels, you can then work out the proportions of blue and red margin. And it all turns out that about only 10% of this orbital margin is formed by this robust um, portion on the uh, ascending process of maxilla, and all the rest is this rather flimsy, very, very thin structure. If you do a similar analysis to uh, another cryptoclided plesiosaur, Marinosaurus, again, we saw its cervical vertebrae earlier on, um, you see that that's about 30% smooth bone, and that's largely because the smooth border continues up about halfway along the frontal, uh, and then the so posterior half of the frontal border reverts this sort of fingered process um, type appearance. So the rest of the orbital margin is very similar. It's got this fingered bone along here, along the post-frontals and post-orbitals, and also along this part here on the maxilla. Um, so if we put that out on a, a plesiosauroid um, phylogeny here, so plesiosaurus itself up here, um, I've got the green is for the prefrontal, um, so it's large, it borders the nearest and the orbit. Blue is for the orbital margin, so blue means it's all a very robust mortal margin, and the red there is for the jugal, so it's large, it's horizontally oriented, and it's actually got a, um, a sort of pointed anterior border. It's formed the uh, lower border of the, of the orbit. Um, if we go into the microclides here, we see it's essentially the same, but the jugal has become squared off anteriorly. Uh, this thing here, plesiopterus, um, if I actually, well, that's the, the published reconstruction by Grossman, 2007. That's actually a, uh, a chimera formed by a uh, plesiopterist, but also one of the microclides, uh, Celiosaurus. So if we tweak that slightly, if you scale in the actual elements from plesiopterist, you find the jugal is rather smaller, uh, the prefrontal is also rather smaller, uh, and it's perhaps mirroring what's happening in the rest of the, the, more, well, the cryptoclides proper. So this is Marinosaurus here from one of my earlier uh, studies. Um, again, there's no clear prefrontal, but maybe it was hidden in this, as in cryptoclidus. The jugal is rather smaller, but it's not quite vertical yet, but it's very much reduced, and we've got this reduced posterior border of the, of the orbit. Cryptoclidus, we've just seen. Trioclidus seems to be something, something maybe similar, but the jugal isn't preserved, so we don't know if it was completely vertical as in cryptoclidus or just reduced as in uh, Marinosaurus. Chimerosaurus here is essentially doing the same as Cryptoclidus, although we don't have the orbital margin preserved in that animal in its entirety, so it's hard to see exactly what's going on there. Climbosaurinae are the sort of sister clay to this subclade of Cryptoclidids, um, and they don't seem to basically don't have any skulls at all. So I'm afraid we don't have much uh, to say about Climbosaurine skulls uh, at the moment. Um, just as a, an interesting thing to note, Xenopsaria here, this is the, the clay depletosaurus, which includes the uh, mega long-necked um, elasmosaurids. Uh, these, these form the major plesiosaurian component of the fauna of the Cretaceous. Um, they actually have pretty much uh, a plesiomorphic configuration here. So they've got a large prefrontal, at least uh, in Brancosaurus here, one of the earlier 
ones we, we know of. Uh, they've got a robust orbital margin, and they've also got a large horizontally organ, um, oriented and anteriorly pointed jugal as well. So this is all rather plesiomorphic. Cryptoclides, I think, are doing something different, special. Um, and we're not, still not quite sure what it is, but we're getting there, I think. And it's specimens such as these that are helping us to find out what's going on. So uh, I'll end there and say uh, thank you to people for letting us look at their specimens. Uh, and thank you for listening. <laughs>